Well, when I was in eighth grade, all I ever wanted to do was to be a professional basketball player. Uh, I think the writing was on the wall. I was only going to be five foot seven, but I didn't care. All I wanted was to be a professional basketball player. And so I would go out and shoot almost every day, working on my craft, making sure that I had my form down perfect. But I remember one fateful day. I call it faithful. Fateful. It was fateful because of my actions. Uh, I was shooting and I would not go in. No matter how much I tweaked my form, it just wouldn't go in. It was one of those horrible days. I was got frustrated, and I, but I kept after it. And it kept not going in. I got more frustrated. And finally, in my frustration, I took the ball and I slammed it down. Now, if you take a round object that's inflated and push it against a hard surface at a high rate of speed, what's going to happen is it's going to shoot right back up into my face, which is exactly what happened. And there I was with my face hurting, thinking to myself, that wasn't a very good idea. I was reflecting on that and what it means to have those moments in your life when you do something and there is a direct consequence linked to your actions. And then you say, ow, I don't want to do that again. You know what's funny? I've been thinking, wouldn't it be great if parenting was that easy? If every time your kid messed up, there was a ball that would bounce right back up and whack them, and then you'd be like, yeah, they'll teach you right there. Parenting would be so much easier if that was just the case, that every time there was a poor choice, there would be a direct consequence with it. And that's not really how life goes. Because sometimes there are consequences that don't link to it. And other times there's just a lot of pain and you don't know where it's coming from. And today we're going to talk about this in our We series, the idea of we're spirit looking for spiritually healthy relationships. We're talking about how God plus me plus our kids equals the we. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. I'm not in active parenting. This is relevant for all of us. Every single one of us. I remember going through a stage in the last year or so where I was really wrestling with what about this, this equation? Me plus pain. Because I think there's an, a, a temptation that we see pain as the problem and then often we look for someone to blame. And this is what we end up doing. We, our equation is me plus plain, pain equals a removal of God. And I was sharing with a friend. Uh, I was uh, over in Sisters and I was talking with a friend of mine named Ryan. And we were sitting at a coffee shop and I was sharing with him some of the, the actions that I had done. And I was sharing with him some of the pain that I was going through. You know what he said to me? He said, wow, it sounds like Hebrews 12. And it's funny, I had memorized it back in college, and I hadn't thought of it, but he was so right. Hebrews 12, the second part of it, is all about, it's all about discipline, and how God in his gracious love disciplines us. To give you a little context of this section, it's coming actually right after the hall of faith that we studied all summer long, where we're looking at these characters, these godly characters who have, by faith followed God. And then the beginning of chapter 12 talks about how because we have all of these people as witnesses, let us run our race. Let's get after it. And then it transitions from that motivating to saying, hey, um, I know you're struggling a bit. I think it may be that God's disciplining you. This is what, what some of it says. This is uh, verse 5 and 6. We're going to pick it up right here. He says, right before this, he says, uh, you haven't yet resisted sin to the point where you're even shedding blood. And you have forgotten this. You have for completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son. There's a dad, a God, a heavenly father who is addressing you and is leaning into your life. He's addressing you as his kid. It says to you, my son, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens the, everyone he accepts as sons. This is a gift, he is saying. This is something amazing. He's actually comparing a little bit. He gives himself this image of that God the Father is relating to us. And we've been talking about this actually probably for the last 15 years. We've heard it at Family Church. Um, I don't know if Pastor Paul created it or if he heard it from somewhere. But he always says this. That the horizontal, how we relate to our family, how we relate to others, it rests on the vertical of how we relate to God. And God is saying, let me give it to you in this way. When you are suffering, I am your dad, I am your father, and I am rebuking and chastening. I am helping correct you and guide you. I am a good father. You know, I was thinking about this. Whenever you, you, you think about God as a father, you think of him as a perfect father. Now, whatever image you have of your dad, 
is inadequate to think about that in comparison with God the Father. Because unlike our fathers, unlike the father that my kid has, he is a perfect father. And his love is the heartbeat of this. But I want you to see something here. I want you to see a little equation. Consequences plus reflection, that's where you find discipline. When something is going wrong, basketball bouncing off the ground, smacking me in my face, when we take those consequences and we take the time to reflect on them, that's when discipline happens. One of the things that my wife is so good at when she's parenting um, our, uh, with, with, with our kids, whenever there is a consequence, whether or not it's like timeout or a loss of something, she's so good at bringing it back in to say, now, why were you in that? Why did that consequence happen? Let's reflect on what happened. Because when that happens, change happens. Now, one of the things that, that I think is interesting, whenever I say the word discipline, raise your hand if you have a negative connotation, right? Usually it includes pain. It includes loss. It's no fun. But let me just flip, use the same word and flip it for us. The opposite of a disciplined person is an undisciplined person. Raise your hand if you want to hire an undisciplined person. <laughs> you don't. Raise your hand if you want to hire a disciplined person. You bet, because we love the end product of this. But because this process, especially this, and a lot of times this, we actually think of discipline as a negative connotation. One of the things like, I was thinking about as I was sitting there at a coffee shop with a friend of mine who was pointing out, Will, this is happening. This is your action. This is discipline. God is disciplining you. And I, I think sometimes this, here's our thinking. No, 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 no. I, I don't need to be disciplined. I'm not. I turned 18. I moved out. Discipline only happens when your parents are right ra- now. It's not true. The reality is that we are continue to be disciplined. And I want you to, 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 to write this down. In fact, on your outline, I want you to notice this. We're unfinished. In fact, God in his work with us continues to process, process this through with us. And, and I would say this, perhaps the most difficult person you will ever have to parent is the person you see in the mirror every day. In fact, when we think of this in terms of the unfinished business of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to be an unfinished product, I am not yet a disciplined person to where God is calling me to. And I know that I love this. We'll never make it there, whatever God calls us to. We won't make it there. That's the beauty of heaven. But it's encouraging to me to know that we're unfinished because all of us have an opportunity and the ability to say, God, work in my life. Sometimes I think it takes someone sitting down with us at a coffee shop and saying, and I think God's disciplining you. I think he's working on you. Uh, I I was uh, reading a book and I came across a story about Billy Graham's wife. Billy Graham's uh, a famous, um, um, I wouldn't call him a pastor. He was someone who would present the gospel and he would make these great crusades at different cities and he would draw people in and share Jesus with them. Um, But his wife was at home raising the kids most of the time. But what she saw is that she was unfinished. In fact, on her tombstone, this is so beautiful, Ruth Bell Graham. And at the bottom, it has a little line. Think of this. This is one of the most godly women of the 20th century. And this is what she says. End of construction. Thank you for your patience. You know, look at the beauty of that. She understood this. She is an unfinished product. And I want to encourage you. Some of you feel the weight of your brokenness. I want you to know we're all unfinished products. And God in his faithful love is disciplining us. He is growing us. He is working in us. Now, as we look at this, I want you to hear something that comes from verse 7. Because we've looked at 5 and 6. Look what it says in verse 7. Because sometimes we we have pain. And that pain comes because we have foolishly hit the basketball and it comes up on our face. But have you ever noticed that sometimes there's just a lot of pain? And you look around and you don't know why because you didn't do anything? Case in point, raise your hand if your life is a little bit more difficult because of COVID. You probably need to have your hand up. Because if it's not more difficult for you, it's difficult for your friends. Life is different because of this. Well, who sinned that caused this? It, it, no, this isn't because of sin. This is, this is a virus. We live in a fallen world. 
But this beautiful thing, I think God so wants to grow us and redeem us. He says, even when it's not your fault, look what it says here in verse 7. Endure hardships as discipline. Endure COVID as discipline. So key here. You, it's not actually because something happened to you, but because God can use even the difficult things that are not related to my actions. It can still grow us. This as is so critical. Endure pain. Endure suffering. And see it through the lens of God is growing me. As we look at this, I think it's so critical that we come with this idea that we're unfinished products because I want to speak to the fact of what it means to be a parent. I mean, a parent of a, a human being, not being Father God for us, but what it means for me. I have, personally, I have an eight-year-old and a 12-year-old at home. Some of you are, you're, you're in your 60s and your kids are grown and gone. Maybe you're in your 80s. Some of you, you, your kids are just young and they're little. But I want you to notice something that it says right here. It says this in verse 10, and I'm reading this from the New Living because the way that it worded it was so rich. Just listen to this. It says, for our earthly fathers, so now we're talking about earthly Father, we disciplined us for a few years. And then look at this line. It's so great. Doing the best they knew how. That fits so well. You know what? The odds are pretty good that your parents messed up. In fact, do something for me. Raise your hand if you were ever hurt by your parents. Right. For those of you that are parents, raise your hand if you ever hurt your kids. Where the word that you said out of place, the anger, the getting too rough, or perhaps you were just distant. Yeah, you understand this. They did the best they knew how. You know that your parents didn't mess up on purpose. It's difficult. Parenting is hard. And I want you to see this, that we're all inadequate. But here's the beauty of it. It also means that in our inadequacy, that means the beauty of God the Father can fill in the gaps. A few weeks ago, I was reflecting on what it means and what this has meant for my father. Uh, I've had multiple people in my life who have played the role of spiritual fathers. I have a picture here. This is of uh, Pastor Ed and Pastor Paul who have both played roles in my life of being people who are godly men, and they played the role of a godly father. You know what I noticed about my dad? Whenever I would talk about them, and I would talk about them in this format, I never saw my dad get insecure about this. Wouldn't it be tempting for him to say, oh, yeah, it reflects that I'm inadequate? I think my dad was completely secure in the fact that he's inadequate as a father. And this is when I came to understand that he has no problem with Pastor Ed and Pastor Paul being spiritual fathers because I pray with all my heart that God brings people into my son and my daughter's life like Ed and Paul. Because I'm inadequate. We're inadequate. This is the beauty of the church is that the church can come along and say, I will be a partner with, with each other. Can I give you a little piece of advice? How you act around people of smaller stature, little people at church will have a huge impact on what they think about church, which is the bride of Christ. And it will reflect on whether or not they have a relationship with Jesus. When I was a kid, I remember a lady named Gracie and she was anything but graceful. She was so mean to kids. She hated that we ran. She wanted to control everything. It was just, she was a nightmare. I remember one time we were running and we were outside and she caught us and she got in her anger. She says, how many times have I told you not to run? And then she realized we were outside. And then she switched it to, on these church grounds. And now we couldn't even run in the grass because she was so angry. You know what's funny? She may have had a relationship with Jesus that was wonderful, but I never saw it. All I felt was how angry she was. That affected how I saw church. And when you're the church and there's the little guy running by, can I show you one of the most powerful things that you can do? You get down on their level and you talk with them. Now, if the person's in high school and you do this, that doesn't work nearly as well. But if they're little people, engage with them and realize you are a reflection of the church. I, uh, I was reflecting on uh, the sermon that we did a few weeks ago where I told a story of, of this wonderful woman. This is my grandmother. And I was telling you the story about the way that she loved and overcame the way that my grandfather had treated her. And she loved him like Jesus. 
But you know, there's always more impact to the story than just that. You see, there was an impact on this little girl. This is my mom. And when my mom was seven years old is when the impact really came. That was the first night that she remembers my granddaddy beginning to lose it, beginning to lose, lose his touch with reality. That was the day that my uncle was born. And my mom remembers the glassy-eyed look in my grandfather's face, and he said, I'm hearing voices again. And in some ways, he never came back from that. And we talked a few weeks ago about how my grandmother responded to that. But that had an impact on my mom. Because my mom had an inadequate father. And I remember sitting with my mom one evening at bedtime, and I was asking stories about granddaddy. He died when I was two. I didn't know him, so I was asking questions. And through the course of time, she told me some of the stories that I told you a few weeks ago. And I was crying, and she was crying. And then she said something so powerful to me. She quoted Psalms where she said, Do you know, Will? God is a father to the fatherless. So what that means is I had the best dad ever. What a beautiful piece there is in that. Because it means that in my inadequacies, I can trust the goodness of God. That he's a good father. So as we look at our inadequacies, I want you to realize that there are certain parts that we play. And though we are inadequate, there's a role that I play as a father. There's a role that you play as a mother. There's a part that's our part. This is my part to play as a parent. To train up a child in the way he should go. To point them towards Christ. To do the best that we can in all of our flawed ways. There's a part that we play. But there's a little bit more. Not only is there our part. Whether or not the kid turns out well. Some of it relates to us. But a great deal of it is their part. And we have to realize this. Our children are people that will make choices. They may or may not follow Christ. They may or may not make wise decisions. Our job is in all that we can with all that we can do is do our part and hopefully train them to do their part as well as possible. But ultimately, kids have choices. And then the beauty of the, the thing that encapsulates this all, what Romans 12 says, what my friend Ryan said to me sitting at a coffee shop, there's more than just your dad's part, there's more than just your part, there's also God's part, and then our response to it, there's my part, their part, and then there's God's part. God plays a role. And if you think that parenting is you're going to control your kid into becoming the great person you want them to be, you have a flawed view. I say you as though I don't do that. Let me, I, I apologize. We if we think that parenting is all about my control of our kids, your control of our kids, then we miss something important here. We miss that they play a role and that God plays an important role. So as we move forward, we've, we've seen that, that we are unfinished products, that we're still being parented both by God and we're learning how to reparent ourselves. And then we're also saying that we're all inadequate as parents, meaning that we have to trust both the community that God has given us and the church. One of the things I wanted to share with you is when you look at the inadequacy of your parent, sometimes that wound needs to be healed. And if you're in a life group that's doing this spiritually health, or emotionally healthy spirituality, um, chapter three is going to be a real blessing. Well, chapter three will be a real blessing, but it may be very, very difficult. You're going to do a thing called a genogram. In it, you're going to look back and say, what is it that my mother brought to, to the table? And what is it that my father brought? And maybe you have a stepfather and a stepmother. You may have multiple facets here that impacted you. And you have to take an honest look at it. And then what it allows you to do is to take some healthy steps forward to say, something has to heal. Because you can see the inadequacies of us. My, my children will have to heal from the pain that I have caused them. And I have to heal from the pain that my parents have caused me. It is a perpetual part of life. And what the genogram does from this, it allows you to take a look at them and stop and say, what is the honest truth about how I grew up? And then perhaps you can take that step forward and begin moving past. Now, I know a lot of people don't want to deal with what's underneath the surface, and it would be much easier to just move on. But I think healing is part of what this entails. Is healing past their broken places. 
Uh, as we move on through the scripture, uh, verse 11, um, follow this. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. But later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Man, you get a serious amen on this. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. It's painful. And one of the things I think that we need to see here is, let's be honest, that it is painful. In fact, this may be the very thing that some of us need to hear is that we have to be okay that being disciplined is painful. Let's go back to this. The consequences plus reflections equals discipline. Consequences are almost always painful in the correction of who we are. So I want to look at, uh, some, we, before COVID, we haven't done it since COVID started, but uh, for years my wife and I have been teaching a class called Love and Logic where we kind of give some, some skill sets to how, how do you raise kids uh, from a biblical perspective in a way that helps them make choices. It really so much of it comes down to choices because you, you look at this. The consequence plus the reflection equals discipline. You have to choose to take the reflection and let it change you. And we believe that this is a format that's really helpful. And it has multiple styles of parents and it helps us talk through it. One style of, uh, of uh, parent is a helicopter parent. Now a helicopter is an amazing invention. You picture when, when flight was invented and they were able to take off in an airplane, but you would have to be keep going, at, keep going in one direction. You could just hover over an area. A helicopter allows you to rescue someone from the air from above. It's an amazing invention. Here's the problem. When that is used as a parenting device to say, whenever my child is feeling discomfort, I will come in and rescue. There's a huge problem with that. And this ultimately comes down to how you see parenting. I currently have an 8-year-old and a 12-year-old. But I'm not parenting an 8-year-old. And I'm not parenting a 12-year-old. I'm parenting a 38-year-old. And I'm parenting a 52-year-old. And I'm parenting a 60-year-old. See, my, the mindset has to be we're not dealing with a, an 8-year-old and a 12-year-old. We're growing them towards adulthood. So how would I help them grow into the mindset that it takes to be an 8-year-old? Not an eight-year-old, a 38-year-old, not an eight-year-old. So what ends up happening here is you start thinking, how would a 38-year-old need to respond to things? Well, what does a 38-year-old have? They have a mortgage. They have responsibilities. They understand alarm clocks. They understand how to handle time. They know how to handle finances. How many eight-year-olds know how to do those things? Most of them don't. But we begin the process of putting them in there. Well, what happens is when you have a helicopter parent, whenever there's a failure to follow through on something, the helicopter parent will come in and say, no, no, that's my baby. Don't let the pain. And remember, let's go back to that. What, what did verse 11 say? No discipline is pleasant at the time. In fact, it's painful. And the idea being it's part of what trains us. And if the helicopter comes in and says, I'm going to protect my baby from pain, they're removing them from the opportunity to grow. What you'll often find if you have an extreme helicopter parent is that the child is so used to getting their own way, they have a lot of difficulty in adulthood because they're unstable. Because they expect mommy or daddy is going to come and save them. Now, how many people want to hire someone that comes from a helicopter home? You, you don't really want to. Because they're not stable. They're not, they don't have the ability to handle, uh, they don't know how to handle pain at all and difficulty. They often don't have that stability and that says, I'm going to press through. They lack the grit it takes to get through it because anytime it got difficult, someone came in and saved the day and made it easier. And one of the reasons we do this, and this makes perfect sense to me, because that's how parenting starts. You're given this beautiful bundle of joy. You can't say to the eight-day-old I'm training you to be the 38-year-old. Now, you, no, 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 listen to me. You're going to, no, of course, you can't do that. When the child cries, it's because there's a problem. And so you're, it needs something. So you're wiping their bottom and, and you're feeding them. Well, over time, there has to be a transition where we move from my job is to help this baby feel better to my job is to help this person grow into a mature adult. You see, at the beginning, it's not really about maturity. It's about caring for a need. But at some point, it has to transition. The next one we have is what we call a drill sergeant. Now, there's a myth on this where the idea of a drill sergeant, where he's always screaming. But one of the things I want you to see is, who is in control of this situation here? It ain't him. It's this guy. So think about this. In the home, how much control does a child have? Now, I don't mean that we want our children to run the home. 
But consider this. If every decision's made by the parent, the drill sergeant, when does the child ever learn how to make a decision? And I give you a huge caution here. If they don't know how to make decisions, what are they going to do when peer pressure comes? Do they know how to stand? What, what, what would it look like if we were giving choices to kids at a young age so they knew how to like, well, if I do this, this is going to happen. If I do this, this is going to happen. This seems like a wise decision. There are no decisions in a drill, parent, um, a drill sergeant parent home because they know better. And if you consider it this way, all, playing all the way out on, on that decision making, if they don't learn how to make decisions, how can they ever make the decision to become a follower of Christ? You see, I think what happens in a drill sergeant home is that mistakes are seen as the enemy instead of learning opportunities. I, I, I'll say this. Um, I've heard that um, when you come from a drill sergeant home, one of two options will happen. You will either mimic what you saw and you, that, that kid will be raised to be more like Hitler because they will think they need to control everything because that's what they saw mom, mom or dad do. The other one is that they'll never make any decision because they've never made a decision. The two things that are deadly. The next thing I want you to see is what about the idea of a consultant? A consultant. And ask a simple question. Remember, a consultant, they don't really have any skin in the game. Now, in parents, you have skin in the game. But the idea being is whose decision is it? Whose responsibility is it? Whose consequence is it? It's his. It's hers. It's not mine. My job as a parent is to help guide them to make wise decisions. And then we ask this simple question. Whose problem is it? If the homework didn't get done, whose problem is it? It's the kids. Well, who's going to pay the price? Well, if you back up to this, the drill sergeant never let that problem happen because this parent was on them so much. Is this done? Is this done? Is this done? Is this done? And never gave them the opportunity to say, hey, um, homework's done at this time. I, I love the idea for our consultant parent. Uh, one of the things they do is they'll give time limits for things and then never remind because that's how they get to learn. So if you say, hey, the, the uh, leaves have to be raked by 6 o'clock on Saturday night. Have fun. And you tell them on Monday, how many times should you remind them? Zero. Let them figure it out. And if they don't get it done, the leaves will still be there. But you have given them an opportunity to feel the consequence that they didn't manage their time well. Uh, I remember when I was teaching, I, I got a a kid into my class, and I could tell his parents were not consultant parents. Uh, he had been homeschooled, and he had been the type of homeschooled where he had figured out the system. If he just kept saying, I don't get it, his mom would just do the work for him. And so he came up to me and said, I don't get it. And I said, okay, which part don't you get? And he realized very quickly I was not going to give him the answers that he had been given all along because it wasn't my problem. It wasn't my homework. It was his problem. And it didn't take long, and he stopped coming to me saying, I don't get it. And he started doing his work. But you could see the difference there that he had not been trained to say, this is my problem. And what you'll find if you raise kids in a consultant mindset, you'll set choices for them. But not only will you set choices for them, you'll give them opportunities. And I have to say, there's this one moment where you're trying this and you're setting it up and you're doing stuff at home and you're seeing maybe some glimpses that this is working well. But it's really tested when they get out into the world a little bit more. And when uh, Anderson was five, he was at uh, preschool. And at the preschool, you know, there's 10 kids or so. And they're all around a cool water table. And this is indoors. But it's one of those uh, tables where they have little, it's probably got six inches of water. And it's about waist high for the kids. And it, I don't know how it happens. But in the middle of playtime where they're all playing with the water toys and the teacher's over somewhere else, the water stopper comes out. And all of the water goes gushing down. Now, I don't know if you remember what it's like to be three, four, and five. But there's a typical response anytime there's a crisis, especially including water. It's called a freak out. And what, I don't know if you remember this. I'm going to teach you how if you have forgotten. There's uh, three components to a freak out. Uh, number one has to do with your feet. They go side to side like that. And then you have your arms do something very similar, but they're not corresponding. So you just kind of freak out like that. And then your, your voice goes, ah, like that. And what you don't ever think about is how do you solve the problem? Well, here's this great moment where we had been trying with all of our hearts to try and help Anderson and Anna 
uh, learn how to make wise choices, to be responsible, to see problems and fix problems, to see messes and clean messes. And Anderson, in that moment, when everything is falling apart, the world is travesties all around him, he sees a bucket, grabs a bucket, and sticks it under the water and catches the water. And so when the teacher comes, the problem isn't nearly as big. And we heard that story. I don't know if you know what it's like when you have um, all of a sudden you get uh, the call or a text or you're, you're talking to the teacher and you're like, hey, we need to talk. And like, oh my goodness, I don't know that this is going well. And then you hear, hey, this is what we saw in your son. And you're like, oh, it works. That was great. Because one of the things you'll have to see here, it, when you go with a consultant parenting, you're giving them their part. But you're giving it to them in small, manageable, bite-sized pieces. An interesting idea for you, if you have younger kids at home, it seems like bedtime is often the most difficult time. Uh, Crystal and I kind of stumbled upon uh, something that was very helpful for when our kids were young. They've outgrown this, but it was really helpful when they were younger. We noticed that there were certain things that were really hard. And so if we set a timer that said, you have five minutes to brush your teeth, you have five minutes to put your pajamas on, you have five minutes to clean your room, they began to see time as something that they needed to manage. And I remember at one point, consultants will often say this. They'll say, hey, can I give you a piece of advice? And it gives them a chance to be thinking, well, yeah, give me a piece of advice. Anderson was done, brush, let's say, brushing his teeth. And he had extra time in that little space there. And we said, hey, buddy, why don't, why don't you go ahead and get your jammies on now? Then you have extra play time in the next one. He's like, I can do that? And he started thinking about, if I get all of my work done, I have an extended amount of extra play time. Well, what do we see there? We've handed him a choice. We gave him advice. And whose decision was it? And in this case, the consequence for it was a positive consequence. He got an extended amount of playtime because he had gotten all of the work done for all of the clocks in the first part. And he started working hard to move things forward. I, uh, I have to say one of the, the things that's a treasure whenever you're a, in the process of parenting, it's being married to a great parent because it makes everything so much, so much more special. And I have to say, I am so blessed to be married to someone who is an amazing parent. In fact, if, uh, especially if, if, you, if, if you've gone through a stage younger than ours, if you want advice, my wife is amazing at walking people through, helping them see what the problem is and helping them see how to make an alteration. I remember uh, some of the great things that she said to, to the kids. Hey, if sweet things can't come out of your mouth, sweet things can't go in. So the idea of if we can't be kind with our words, we're probably not going to get sweet things going in. She has this ability to, to say it in a way that is so transferable and it sticks so well. What a blessing uh, she is. So just a quick review. Number one, we're unfinished. Number two, we are inadequate. And number three, parent, no, parenting is painful. I was going to say discipline is painful and that's okay. We have one last question we're going to ask you at each of our campuses, and Jason's going to take over online. We love you guys, and we will see you next week.